thank you very much for attending the this webinar. First of all, uh, I just want to confirm that you are listening to me well. So please, if you can text me uh, through the uh, through the chat and telling tell me that you're listening, uh, that, that the audio is okay, then uh, perfect. So I'm starting to see. Great. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Um, well, the, for the ones that are, can't hear, I'm going to just post a message in the Q&A, just in case someone is not listening well. Um, just a second. well okay so we're now ready to start uh first of all good evening good night good afternoon good morning i don't know where you're based so uh i'll just reach you just in case um well my name is hernan Rechnicki. i'm argentinian uh, i have been working as a data scientist for over seven years now uh, and I'm working right now as fast lane as a trainer, and I'm going to introduce you to the alternatives that GCP provides in terms of machine learning and how you can make full use of it. So first of all, before we begin, I wanted to, to talk briefly about fast lane. Fast lane is a, is a group that um, works uh, in training and consulting in uh, a huge variety of, of different technologies. And so I encourage you, in case you're interested, to take a look at www.flame.de slash en and check out uh, what we have to offer. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> presence in more than 60 countries, so um, just uh, don't hesitate to take a look and uh, drop us a line in case you're interested in some other training uh, on-site or remote. Well, then we're going to talk, as we said, about the possibilities uh, of um, machine learning inside GCP. So before we really begin, uh, we are going to this this webinar is going to be about the possibilities of implementations of machine learning. We're not going to talk about um, concepts regarding machine learning because that's something that really exceeds the scope of this of this webinar. And uh, to be honest, that takes much, much more, much longer than just the hour, or hour and something that this webinar uh, is going to <coughs> to last. So. Super brief introduction, machine learning is um, a technique that creates rules out of data based on machine learning algorithms. So the, um, we can say, or we can, we can summarize that as that machine learning algorithms are algorithms that create algorithms. So after we uh, create those rules and we have our uh, model, so how we call it, then this model can help us to take certain decisions. Okay, so I um, maybe you should uh, take check out if you have connected with. Um, sorry, just one one thing. Uh, yeah, I have uh, the Alan. Uh, just a second. Okay. 
there is somebody, someone who's not being able to listen, and I would like to ask him if he can um, check something out. Just one second. Well, okay, sorry, uh, I'm going to retake where I was. Um, well, as we were saying, Machine learning is a set of algorithms that out of data or out of samples can create a set of rules that we can make use of to uh, take certain decisions. So given this brief introduction, let's jump into a brief example. So here we have how uh, a possible machine learning model may look like. In this case, it's an image classification uh, machine learning model. And the model can be trained as follows. So uh, we have a certain set of images. In this case, the, those images are going to be the input to our training model. And we have the labels. The labels are the categories or what we want, said more broadly, what we want to, to infer, in fact. So how does a machine learning model work? Uh, given a set of inputs, in this case, a set of, uh, of images and its corresponding labels, the machine, mo machine learning model, which is no more than a huge mathematical machinery, uh, will create uh, rules and math mathematically, statistically based to infer the probability that certain new in certain input uh, is of a certain category. So after we um, generate those rules based on samples, we can see how well the model, the model uh, performs on new unseen data by passing data that was not used in the training stage. So for example, in this case, we, are, we had um, trained the model with different animals and objects, and we're passing an image of a cat. But we're not, of course, not telling the model that we are passing an image of a cat. So we want to know how good the inference is, or we want, to, we want the, the model to infer what kind of object it is. And in this in the slide, so said conceptually, uh, the, the model is uh, turning back uh, a label. In reality, what, you, what, we, what we obtain at the end of the model is a set of um, probabilities for each of the labels that we have trained with. So going back to the previous slide, sorry. If we have a model that uh, was trained with cats, dogs, cars, and apples, then it's going to give us the probability that the new image is, uh, the probability that the new image is a cat, a dog, a car, or an apple. Of course, if the model was, um, was trained correctly and, and, and has a good performance, we probably will have a much higher probability on cat than what we will have on any other of the elements. So where are we going to focus uh, today? As we said, this, the, this is the, the, in the training stage. We have normally the, um, it's where the, the most of the focus is, is put on. It's like we always are trying to generate the best model we can with the best performance, but there is something that we always oversee, and it's how, we, how do we put our 
trained models in production. So how do we use these models in an effective way in terms of, of, of IT infrastructures especially? So, for example, if we can generate our best model, but if that model cannot be, um, if we cannot handle the requests to that model, then that model, although it's, uh, it may uh, look perfect, it's not going to have any use because if the, if the implementation of uh, the deployment of that model is not good, then uh, it's, it's just useless because we are not going to be able to have something working appropriately. So what we are going to do in this hour as well is to take, and especially uh, what we're going to do is to take a special focus on how do we implement models and how, how do we make most use of our models inside GCP. So, in this sense, I would like to divide or have divided this presentation in three main parts. So the first, the first one is ML prêt à porter. Uh, sorry for the French speaking audience. Uh, pardon my French. I know this is not a way it's written. The idea is this is machine learning ready to go. And that's what Google ML APIs are. So I'm going to uh, present Google ML APIs right now. And after that, I will open the space for questions regarding that particular topic. OK, here we have picture of Paris. So what in kind of information can we get out of this picture? Here are some examples. A sign, street number, street name, a facade, a traffic light. Well, it's not highlighted here in this example, but we can also uh, identify people, identify cars. So the possibilities are multiple. This kind of objects, so are uh, very, um, come, sorry, come by default in all the vision APIs. So Google provides us with uh, machine learning APIs that are able to identify common objects in images and in text and in uh, voice that we can make use of uh, out of the box. For example, well, as we said, all these kind of objects, people, cars, what is, in which cases do we use these machine learning APIs? So mainly in those cases where we need um, a, an inference of objects that are invariant in time and mostly also um, not specific to a business case. For instance, if we need to identify humans in a picture, then probably regardless of what is our final objective, we're going to have always the same model. So if no matter if I just need to count people uh, in an image or if I have to do, let's say, um, a model that can identify um, robbery in a, or shoplifting in a, in a picture, in both cases, I will probably need to identify humans first. And in, since a human body is always of the same shape or more or less of the same shape, we always uh, are going to be able to use these machine learning APIs provided by Google. So the, the machine learning APIs from Google uh, help us to organize our data and to obtain very, very quickly um, <clears throat> labels out of, the, of images, audio, video, and text. We're going to see shortly how. I'm going to give a, a, a very brief demo. And we can then make use of those, in the, of those um, identifications to do further developments. For instance, to other uh, custom machine learning models with CloudML, which is what we, which, which is what we are going to see next. So, the 
The APIs that uh, Google provides are mainly five. The Vision API, which is what we have seen right now, I'm going to, to give a very small demo right now. The Speech API, which is basically turns speech into text, so audio to text. Jobs API, that's something that related to job search and, and, and job analytics. Translation API, which is uh, what we always use as end user as Google Translate, but on an on a API based. And natural language API, which is um, text analytics. We are going to see now two examples, one for Vision API and one for natural language API, direct from the, um, from the websites from, from each of the services. So let's start with um, the, the Vision API. This is an example of what we can do. We're going to put, as I said, I'm Argentinian, so I'm not very creative with uh, examples. We have uh, Messi here, and uh, what can what did the the service identify? So, first of all, identified a face, and then it identified certain um, emotions. Please take into account that this is always, as we said, the labels are given by humans. So, sometimes we cannot, as a human, identify which exactly, we can, which kind of emotion a face shows. So the models uh, regarding emotion may not be very accurate sometimes. Uh, I, I would say they're as inaccurate as a human. So in this sense, sometimes you may notice that you have certain screen pass discrepancies, sorry. Well, that has to do, of, of course, as well with the discrepancy you can have with other humans. So. As I said, well, you can see uh, what kind of um, emotion this person or, or this face may be expressing. Then we have certain labels. So this, uh, and in this sense, as we are not, uh, as, as we are also pretty certain of what we are seeing in an image, the the system is doing the same, as, and, and the system is succeeds in. Um, identifying the tags that correspond to this image, for instance, player, sport, soccer play, blah, blah, blah. And this is very interesting. It can also find some web entities. For instance, here, it found out that's Messi, that's Barcelona, that's Juventus. Juventus is the other team in, in, in black and white. Uh, so you're not just identifying um, objects, it also identifies sometimes uh, people and teams and other kind of, of objects from the, from the mere picture. So imagine if you had to do all this work for yourself, that would take, I don't know, years of a whole team doing this kind of machine learning uh, models. Here is the uh, image to, to text part. So it reads everywhere where it has, um, where there are um, letters. In this case, as well, a human has very, very uh, little chances of um, getting that wrong, while well, the computer uh, is excels in reading from images, reading text from images. As you can see, the, the, the blocks are very, are very accurate. So this is, for instance, the, the um, the publicity in, in Messi's t-shirt is Rakuten, but probably not, not seeing the R, so it's, it's getting Akuten. So in that sense, the, the, this, the, the, the image to text part works very, very well. And this is something about colors, which is not very important. Uh, here we have um, the probability that the image is expressing some kind of adult content, spoof, medical content, violence, etc. And finally, and uh, what I wanted um, to, to point out and to, to stress is the uh, JSON response. Every model in, uh, every machine learning model that we are going to see today and almost every uh, API based or, or every, everything that goes inside GCP 
is mostly API based. So you are going to uh, obtain every time you have, um, you want to use a machine learning model, you can always do it via API REST. And what you're going to get is a JSON response. What is the very, very interesting thing about this? You don't need to know, uh, you can do it, sorry, in uh, any language you want, in any program. So any programming language is able to um, handle uh, REST, uh, can send a, a REST API request and can read and pass a JSON response. So in this sense, it's, it's, a, it's a complete flexible infrastructure. So the, um, I wanted to show you the, this remains from the, from the Spanish version. I wanted to show you also what, uh, what the analytics part has to offer. Let's put the same, let's same example, the restor, sorry, restaurant was very good. The food was delicious. So, first of all, we have a, an entity analysis where we can see what kind of, of um, entities they are um, pointed out. Then we can see a sentiment analysis. This goes from minus one to one, where one is positive and minus one is negative. Then we have some syntax analysis. And uh, this is not going to, to be supported, but um, what uh, categories what we can see in the categories is sometimes it's uh, the topics about what the, the text is about and, and that kind of, of information. But in order to, to run that, we should be getting a, a much larger text. Good. Here's how the response works. And what is Google suggesting is machine learning APIs. So GCP is in, among other things, an infrastructure provider. So, and in this same sense, the machine learning APIs that it provides are almost infrastructure because as we said, they are invariant in terms, of, uh, they can be used in any kind of business case. So, if we need to identify people, no matter what our industry is, what our use case is, and what our um, what our needs are, we can always use the ML API, and it's going to outperform whatever we can do customly on our side. So I would recommend you to uh, to use them in those in these kind of cases. So sentiment analysis entities analysis for text and for images or video uh, if you if you have to recognize common objects i think uh yes uh, i see many of you have questions um so before we move on I encourage you to uh, write them on the Q&A part. Has anyone any question? Mm, shall I move on? You can write them down anyway. Um, what do you mean, Elvis, by a roadmap? A roadmap of uh, what? Oh, sorry. I'm seeing the questions uh, right now because it was not um, displaying them to me in a good way. Just a second. Uh, 
Okay. Um, yes, you have, um, that's what we're going to see. So, um, Elvis, uh, the, we are going to have special enrollment. So we're going from the most general uh, machine learning uh, alternatives that there are in GCP, which are what we, just, what we have just seen. And we're going to go further into much more custom things, which require, of course, a uh, bit more knowledge, especially on the cloud ML part. So yes, we, you can do APIs out of machine learning for any kind of machine learning model inside GCP. What's what we are going to see next? Good. Uh, to Malish, let me just one second because I cannot see the whole question. Do we need to have basic programming language knowledge for machine learning? So to use the machine learning APIs, no. Let me just write you here to uh, ML to use. Well, you have to have basic programming language knowledge uh, to do machine learning on your own, yes, to use the machine learning models provided by, um, by Google. You need some kind of very basic programming language experience in order to send a, a REST uh, request and receive the chaser response back. So to use ML APIs. to run your own good um to implementing web uh sergio what do you is that written to log file I don't, oh, sorry. Can you just play the change and respond output slide? Sure. Um, it's, they're not, it's not written to a log file. It's written, uh, it's exactly, so you are, you send the, that's what you get in the, in the response. So you don't have, you don't need to implement a web application. The web application is already implemented by Google. You just consume that. Uh, we are going to see how you deploy a web application with your own models, like right now. Um, Elvis, uh, so for question of times, I used to, to write down, but I think it would be better if I just do it orally. Elvis asks if uh, after, if you have speech, video and text, what's next? We are going to see, especially with Cloud ML, that we can use, uh, that we can create machine learning models out of any type of data that will require, of course, some other skills, but of course, uh, um, that, that is also possible. This Google feature is free to use. Uh, it has quotas, so I think it's, um, I don't remember exactly how much the free quota uh, enables, but yes, there is, I think, certain quota that uh, is free to use. Um, do we need to have expertise programming language in machine learning? I would, oh, okay, thank you. Good. Perfect. Great. Uh, any other questions? Is there any recommended, sorry, I um, have to put the questions here because otherwise, is there any recommended docs to read regarding the different programming language and how to use machine learning with these languages, for example, I write in Python, where would I go to learn more about using Python with Google? Great question. Um, I would encourage you to read a bit. We are going to see some bits and pieces about that, but I really encourage you to read about the different um, alternatives that you have within GCP that don't have to be necess don't have necessarily to do with machine learning, but are, um, intimately related with them and that's how how the uh, data processing is done and uh, in, in response to your question python is one of the preferred languages within gcp so um where would you go to learn well first you need to know 
bit about Python or Java, which are Go or whatever language you're using. And then you should be, uh, um, I would encourage you to read the documentation. You have the, all the documentation within Google Cloud Platform. So if you, if you go to different products, you're going to see what are the, um, the requirements for each of them or how do you, especially how do you write and what's the philosophy be behind them and how do you write Python code, Java code or whatever to use the, the different services within GCP. So I'm going to sh just put an example so of which are the products that you may see. And we, it, besides, we're going to see how, or we're going to explain that also in CloudML you're using uh, code, so you're not, um, so that there you will need to, to write your own Python code. And, and there is a documentation about how to write it. So when an image is submitted for analysis, just a second, sorry, I have to, how is this interpreted so quickly? Is the image distributed across many machines and analyzed in parallel? No, uh, that's not possible. The, um, the image is, um, it's one image is, um, is solved by a single machine, but normally, um, Something it depends on it depends on how the how it is implemented, but they have special process, processing units. Especially they work with the graphical processing units that are that have much more workers in parallel, and that's why it can go back so quickly. And it can go it can go sorry even quicker if you think that uh, you can also pass a video feed. So imagine it's almost real time. You have of course a, a latency problem. But uh, but it, uh, the, the, the processing itself from the image is very, very quickly. Uh, going to answer uh, Vladislav. Um, the labels that Google recognized in messy image were including football and team play. Were both labels recognized as a result of image processing or the second label was assigned because the recognized first table Football is always a team play. Um, no, this is, um, I, to be honest, I don't know the, um, the internal implementation of that, but what I would suggest is that no, that they just, um, they work with different categories in parallel that may overlap themselves. So they may be, they may have done a, a model or they have, may have included a category that is team play and another that is football. And when you do the trainings, we are going to see that. Uh, I can show you now when we see AutoML that it, that is a possibility within uh, image object recognition. You can uh, assign more than one label to an image because as you said, and that's a great question, you may have more than one object in an image. So when you do the training, you can say, to the to the, to a training machine uh, that's what google does internally okay this is football and this is team play but they are not necessarily doing a, an expert system that's what i think your approach would be more of an expert system because you are um telling something about uh what it's uh, being recognized in the object that has to do with that uh sergio is machine learning api based on tensorflow framework yes it is okay so if there are uh, no further questions i will move on thank you very much i appreciate all the, the questions good sorry so what happens if our ML API uh, is not, I mean, the Google machine learning APIs, the ones that come ready to use, are just not enough for the problem we have to solve. Our first alternative would be to use AutoML. AutoML is a very interesting tool by, by GCP that uh, enables you to create your custom model to train your custom models without having uh, machine learning knowledge. 
So you don't need machine learning models to train your own models in AutoML. And moreover, you don't need to write code because it's fully GUI based. Again, this comes only in for three particular cases, which are very similar to what we have seen in the APIs, natural language, vision, and translation. So you may ask, well, what's the difference between what we have just seen and this AutoML? Before we get into that, um, into the into a detail, uh, into an example, sorry, about what is what the difference is, and you are going to, to understand that perfectly. Let's uh, let's talk briefly about how the how the training works. You have to provide the labeled material. For instance, as we as we have seen in the in the first part, you have to provide the image and the labels, and then Google does the rest. There are three ways to provide labeled data. That's uploading from your local computer, from via the web GUI or via CSV in uh, and a GCP storage bucket. For the ones that are not familiar with cloud services, a bucket is said broadly very similar to a Dropbox, but bigger, much bigger. So I'm going to show you right now how an AutoML project looks like. So we were saying that we have to uh, upload the images. So our ML vision, the, the, the tool tenant, um, names it a data set. That is what we have in um, uh, all, the, all the machine learning training methods uh, call their, their input data a data set. And we have three ways of doing that. First way is uploading images from the computer. So you have you can upload JPG, PNG, or ZIP, which is what I recommend. And the reason why is the following: you can have, let's say, you have uh, three categories. Then you can uh, have a main folder, and then you can have three subfolders with the categories name. For instance. We're going to see now. We have, we're going to see an example with two categories, which are VM, uh, VMV and Mercedes. So you can have two subfolders, which are Mercedes and VMV, and include all the images from each category in the folder. And then when you upload, when you zip all the the main folder up and upload it, then AutoML automatically assigns the label based on in which subfolder each image is. I'm going to show you how it looks like. Uh, one one detail I'm, uh, I want to, to tell, especially because of Vladislav, the question. Here, you can see that in classification type, you also have the possibility to give more than one label to an image. So, as, as Vladislav was asking about the, the football and the team play, if I want to, um, to have more than one label, I can put the uh, enable multi-label classification and assign multiple labels. As we have seen, well, that's the, those two were examples. We can also assign Messi or Juventus or all the entities that we have seen if we want the model to train all those categories. Well, I'm not going to, to, do, to create the data set now because it's, um, it's a bit uh, time consuming. So I'm going to show you like cooking programs the cake done. So once we have the the data, it looks like this. So back to our example, we have all the car images with the corresponding brand. And for instance, here, imagine I have mis uh, misordered the or, or put the the images in the wrong place. I can always come here and check out the labels. In this case, well, this is a BMW, and it was tagged as a Mercedes. I can put BMW and then hit OK. And it changed. I want to just get back to the image and show you something else. You will always find this option, unlabeled. Why is unlabeled important? It's very important because you may have cases in which you have, uh, let's say, limit 
um, okay, limit samples. For instance, imagine we had a very similar Audi car to this blue BMW that we're having here. So we will want that our uh, our prediction system, our inference system, only uh, identifies BMWs correctly and does, doesn't identify Audis uh, as BMWs. But as we are not using or taking into account Audis in this model, we can put them as unlabeled. And why is that important? Because it will um, be able to make the difference between something that may be a near match and the real matches that we have to that we have that we want to discover let's say um if there are any questions well then please uh, uh at the end of the of the part of this part we can we can may, um, talk about them well finally we can uh, administrate and evaluate and see how the how the different models are in in our gui and once we have, uh, so after we have trained, oh, sorry, I, I'm just going to jump back very briefly here. I forgot to, to show you how easy the train part is. So you just click on train and it trains the model based on the images and the labels you set. Then you can evaluate it once it's, tra uh, it's trained. I'm not going to do it right now because it takes a, 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 a bit of time and we don't have enough samples, but just to, for you to, to understand how it works and you can even predict it and see how, your, how well it, it performs. So once you're happy with your model, then you can um, deploy your model also from the GUI very easily. And once you have it, once, once you deployed it, the model is also accessible via API. And here is an example of how a response of the, of the model, of an AutoML generated model looks like. Well, this is Flowers model, it's taken from the, from the documentation, but you can see how, how it looks like. And it, it refers also to what we were saying at the beginning. We don't get back just a category, we get the probability that the item passed fits some of the categories we have just passed, uh, the, um, we have, uh, with which we have trained the model. So, for instance, in this case, it was a flower model, so it was 0 0.89 for Lily and well, so on. And then you can see that in the, at the end, you're always having another. Another means none of the above. And of course, that gives a probability as well. Good questions about AutoML or about if, if you have any other questions about um, ML APIs, uh, the Google APIs that we have before, we have seen before, of course, more than welcome. Does Google keep the data I provide? Um, Yes, it does. It uh, stores them in a bucket. I can show you where, let me show you briefly. Okay, I want to go out from here. Just a second. Um, because I think um, Elvis, you, you sent me privately the question. I'm just uh, reproducing it. Uh, do you have property rights? Uh, I honestly don't know. I would say um, I, I really don't know, so uh, I don't know if, if there is even possible that that will be, I think that's a question, that's a legal question and probably comes from country to country, um, but you can see the, sorry, have to uh, look it up, here it is, sorry, if you go to storage, you have and that should be somewhere here. No, that's not. Well, yes, but it stores them in, in, in a bucket. I, I just don't want to, to go around, but the, um, it's stored in a bucket. Yes, and, and it's accessible because then you have to, 
when you if you want to do it via via csv you have to pass the path i can show you how it looks like Here is how you do it if you if you upload a CSV instead of instead of doing it via the GUI, you have to put what in what instances train test or validation, then uh, comma the um, the path within the in the Google storage um, bucket and then the 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 label or the labels that you want to that you consider that are appropriate for that case. So any other questions about AutoML? Good. I'm going to move on. We are going, so, so far we have seen that we can use, make use of Google Machine Learning APIs for uh, common, common um, identifications or common, common objects to identify in certain scenarios such as people such as objects in certain common objects in an image or or sentiment analysis we have seen that we can do also our own models based on that kind of input data but as someone stated i don't remember who um, in in one of the questions what happens with all the rest of the machine learning world well all the rest of the machine learning world in gcp comes into cloud ml Good. Before we dig into CloudML, let's talk about how, uh, what are the challenges inside our machine learning, inside the machine learning world. So, if we uh, Google introduction to machine learning, then we're going to see probably a piece of code that mainly takes an input, like, I don't know, if, if anyone has tried it sometime, the, the iris data, which is 300 cases, then you run a model, you run, you train a model with uh, with that data. So you you pick a, a machine learning algorithm to do a training, and then you obtain a model which with which you can do predictions based on that same data. So it looks very easy, but uh, unfortunately, real world is not that easy. Why? Firstly, because the amount of data that you need to use uh, sometimes in order to train accurate models does not fit into memory by no means in any local machine. Even in many cases, it does not fit even in very, very powerful VMs. Or if it fits, it uh, it tends to to uh, perform poorly in terms of uh, processing time. So what you have to think of is distribution. So instead of upscaling, instead of having one very very big machine, having a cluster of machines that can work in parallel. So and that is what uh, GCP offers. And that is how CloudML works. Before we dig into how CloudML works, let's uh, stop a bit in the machine learning training process. Uh, of course, it is not straightforward. Real world also is a bit more difficult, so it's not it's very, very uncommon that you have a straightforward connection between your input data and your model training. In 99% of the cases, you have a pre-processing and a feature creation stage. And in fact, I would say you spend 80%, 85% of your time uh, in the pre-processing and feature creation phase uh, when you do a training uh, a machine learning model and 15% of your time in the the model training itself so what is pre-processing and what is feature creation pre-processing is basically cleaning out your data that means taking out invalid data taking out um, out of uh, let's say out of of, of scale data uh, identifying or maybe taking out even outliers. Outliers are data out of pattern. 
And uh, what kind of things can go into pre-processing? For instance, if you have a column from date from and a column date to, most probably you don't want a date from bigger than the date, sorry, than the date to. So that kind of cases, in case there are any, should be removed. And feature creation is the creation of additional uh, variables or additional features based on your input data. That means those are extra variables or extra inputs to your training model that you create before you get into the model. Why? Because the model is just a mathematical function, so it cannot create features by its own. For example, back to date from and date to. If my, my data set has a date from and the date to column, and I need the amount of days or the, the amount of time between those two, those two variables, then I have to create it because the, the model will never know that it has to do that kind of operation. So those things are the ones that you are going to do during your feature creation. And in fact, if you tell me the, from the 80% percent of the, like the 85% of the time that you spend on pre-processing and feature creation, you spend over 70% in the feature creation part. So feature creation, I would say, is the key for a successful uh, machine learning model. There is still one thing that, uh, that you have to take into account and this is the hyperparameterization or hyperparameter tuning, which is all the, the machine learning training algorithms have parameters. The parameters will result in different types or, or different models with different characteristics. For example, neural networks, uh, you may have uh, heard about them, uh, deep neural networks or, or deep learning is based on neural networks, so uh, we're talking about the same thing is an iterative process. So determining how many iterations the process is going to have is, of course, something that, you, um, that will affect the output, so the, the model itself or, or, or the characteristics of the model, and that you set during the, um, that, you, that you define in, in, uh, when you pass the, the, the model. So the, that's something that you have to specify in order to create the model. Mainly, it's a lot about trial and error in the hyperparameterization, hyper sorry. And, um, well, that's, um, it's always good to have different versions of the same, with the same preprocessing and same feature creation, but different hyperparameters to understand how your data is behaving or how your models are behaving, especially. So, after we have, uh, after we have pre-processed our data, created our features, trained some several several models with different hyperparameters, then we we obtained, of course, several models, and we want we we were after evaluating them, we decided to keep one of them. So, when we have one of them, we want to deploy it. So. This deployment has a lot, a lot of questions. So who is going to use that? How responsive should it be? And uh, how fast should it be? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's uh, on a non-premise architecture. On-premise means that you own your own resources and you administrate your own resources. That's a huge, huge question. So even if you have the best system administrators in the world, you are going to face something that you don't face in GCP. And that is, you are going to be paying for something you are not using at some point of your, um, of your process. I mean, why? Basically, because you are not always having the same uh, demand on your web application. For example, I create a model uh, to personalize an e-commerce site. It's a model that gives us, for instance, 
uh, based on the, the, the history of the, of the person getting in, well, what kind of, uh, of, of uh, products can I offer him or her uh, based on what he has seen and, and all the data I have from, from them. Most probably, that kind of model will be much more requested. The web application will have much more requests at 7 p.m. or 6 p.m. than at 2 a.m. So my infrastructure should be able to handle uh, the requests if I do it on premise based on our, my peaks of demand. So what happens at 2 a.m.? I will have a lot, a lot of idle resources. What is the good thing about GCP? GCP auto scales and out, uh, which means that it goes up and down based on your needs. So GCP's philosophy is you pay for what you use. That means if you have a peak at 7 p.m. and you need 25 machines working in parallel and serving your web application, you have them. If you need two because you have no one asking and, and, and no, um, no request to your web application, then it gets reduced to two machines. You can let um, GCP administrate your, um, your resources and it will be much more optimal than, than if you do it yourself and can warranty that 100%. That redundant not only and we are talking, we're even talking about some ideal world where our clusters work perfectly, where we don't have uh, administration problems within our own premise structures. If we add to that all the problems that may arise because we are administrating our resources poorly, then for instance, which, which can go from um, a, a down of the service uh, a very low response, a very slow response, sorry, and so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are really um, talking about a lot of money that is saved, not only in operations, also in, um, in infrastructure. So I would uh, always really recommend you to use the web applications that Google provides, that GCP provides, not only for uh, machine learning, but for anything you have uh, that can be web-based, uh, web application-based. So, given this, we have to, um, we can go further, and then what, what do we have? We have a client that makes a call, and it gives us the input variables, which, of course, the, is taken by the web application, and the web application returns a prediction or an inference. I, will, I like personally the word inference a bit more. Um, returns the inference back to a client. This web application has a model that is 100% custom. But as you have seen, in order to make this, uh, this model, you will need to have a machine learning expert doing it. And someone who, can, well, Normally, machine learning experts should be uh, also able to program their models by themselves, but sometimes they need some, some kind of assistance, but yes, and you need someone who can program and do machine learning to do these kind of, uh, of applications. Good. As we said, how do we ensure that our uh, inference or the inferences that we are receiving are reliable. So what we have to ensure is that the input data with which we have done the training of the, of the model is the same one as the one that we are passing now to produce uh, inferences. So the logical question that you may uh, be making is, but what does, um, what happens with the pre-processing and the feature creation? Well, in uh, GCP, you have the possibility to, um, in CloudML, sorry, you have the possibility to create a pipeline that contains not only the model, 
but also the pre-processing and the feature creation. What does that mean? That the web application will not only have the trained model, but it will also have the pre-processing and the feature creation. And that is because you can use, uh, in order to use to do your machine learning models, three main libraries. Uh, that is TensorFlow, that is uh, Scikit. Scikit is, well, just a brief uh, reference about both of them. Uh, TensorFlow is um, a library used for, as uh, Sergio said, it's a deep. Uh, it's the, the library that is used to do neural networks and deep learning, that is uh, supported by Google, and and developed by Google. Then you have uh, what's called Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn is a standard. Is the the main library within Python to do um, machine learning models. It has, from my own experience, I I have like hundred percent of matches. In uh, any in any machine learning algorithm, I was uh, I, I wanted to to train on, and uh, I always found everything I wanted inside there. And uh, XGBoost, which is um, a library to do gradient boosting machines, that's uh, something that's a bit out of scope. What a gradient boosting machine is, out of scope of this webinar, but you. It's it's important for you to know that you have these, you have the possibility to create uh, a web app, a machine learning model and serve a web application with these three libraries. And what is the good thing? TensorFlow and uh, Scikit have the possibility to create pipelines. And in these pipelines, I, I don't want to get into much technical details, but you can do both. You can do the pre-processing and feature creation plus the model training. And it gets everything in the same file, which means we are going to see next how, how, the, how the model is deployed and put in production a bit, with a bit more detail. And you're going to understand a bit better what I'm trying to, to explain now. But the good thing about it is that you don't have the two pieces separated. And as you have them together, you will always have the same uh, treatment for the data uh, when you use it for testing that what you used for training. What does that mean? That the input data you're passing is going to be processed in the same way that the input data was, you, uh, was processed when the, when the training uh, was performed. So, nice, very nice thing. We can close our cycle here. Why? we can use most of the cases, the data that we used in order to, uh, to get some prediction, given that it's the same data that we used to create the model, can be then used to create new models. And that is very, very important to keep your models updated. Why? Because if, for example, in, uh, I don't know if someone here works in the stock market may, may know that much better than I, but in the stock market, the conditions change every time. So if the conditions change every time and you always use the same model, the predictions I'm going to get after one week, two weeks, three weeks are going to be very, very poor. Why? Because the conditions have changed and uh, what used to be uh, a good model three weeks ago is no longer um, it's no longer a good model. So, in cases, especially in cases where reality changes a lot, we need to um, to close up the circle and use the the data that we just used to do a prediction will become data to uh, input data for new models. For instance, if I have to do a model. Uh, I have to use a model that takes one week of data, then if I do it today, and I train it today, and then I try to use it on Tuesday, it's going to be five days old. So what I will, what will try to do is try to keep it updated with as much effort as possible. And GCP provides the possibility to close this circle and just uh, use the same, uh, 
the, the same time window over and over again and, be, and have your model as updated as you want. Well, before we, we move on to, to see how a bit how Cloud ML engine is, has to be structured, I wanted to, to mention briefly the existence of, of Data Lab. Data Lab is a very interesting tool for um, collaborative um, data insights, uh, data research, and, and, and machine learning as well, of course, where you can combine text with code and with uh, graphs and images. You can even run the, the code within Data Lab to see what you, uh, to, to inform others for what your findings were and the others can reproduce your experiments. And you can, of course, reproduce the experiments of others. And besides, it also gives you the possibility to, um, to, to have version control, sorry. So since it has version control, you can, um, um, sorry, I, uh, there was a question that I, I'm going to, to give a space uh, right now. Um, since you have version control, then you can work um, collaboratively on the, on the same document. This is, of course, for experimentation. This is not for setting in production. When you set into production, you should be um, taking the, 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 the parts you need and put them productive. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a workflow as with the one we have just uh, seen. Okay, before we move on, uh, I would like to, otherwise we will not, um, I don't want you to lose your questions. So if you have any questions so far, please um, write them down. So Alan is telling me, is asking, what is the difference between Google AutoML and Firebase machine learning? Do you know about this? Um, to be honest, I uh, really don't know if you can do, um, I didn't know that you can do uh, machine learning in Firebase, um, but I will check that out. And then if you want, I can write you privately. And you can, um, I can, will find it out for you and, and eventually send you, send you some info. Um, someone sent me privately a question. Um, please, if you can, uh, I would appreciate if you put it in the Q&A part so that everyone can see it and myself too. Otherwise, it's a bit difficult for me to, to, to find it. Uh, oh, sorry. Here, I see it. Can we work on unstructured data? I'm going to, to post it in the Q&A part. Ah, sorry, here it is. Sorry, Edwin. Um, can we work on unstructured data and machine learning to derive patterns with any of the standard tools? Uh, what do you mean by standard tools? SAS or SPSS or that kind of tools? Okay, so you're going, you're, oh, okay, I understand. So you're, uh, you're asking, correct me if I'm wrong, if you can do AutoML uh, for, um, for your custom data, for, for this kind of, um, I mean, for data that is not uh, in an image or on a text, or uh, I'm not getting your question, maybe. Sergio, yes, it is. In fact, uh, all the, the processing part is done in Dataflow. We are going to see that next, um, but yes. And that's another very, very important advantage of, um, of Dataflow, of, sorry, of uh, CloudML, is that if you, since you're running it in Dataflow, Dataflow is a serverless um, service, so 
the, the cluster is set up to do the processing you just need, and then it goes down. So that's another advantage, and it has the same um, it has all the same advantages that we have just discussed about the, the APIs. You just pay for what you use. So if you set up a cluster with 55 machines because you need it to have be uh, I don't know, very fast and, and you want to set 55 machines in parallel and, and, and do the processing to do the, the, the training of your model, you can do it. And then, of course, the, once the job is completed, the, the cluster is is uh, is um, dismissed, so you just pay for the exact time you used it. If you have to do it on premise and you have to be quick, then you're going to be paying uh, about I don't know 50 machines to use to be used for I don't know 50 minutes. So in that sense, yes, that's another very important advantage of of GCP. Is that the flow part to set up VLVM cluster in GCP? Uh, I not. Uh, do we use the data proc? No, I would uh, always advise to use directly CloudML. CloudML will use data flow uh, behind. Um, what about GPU VM machines? Good questions. Um, if you are using, especially if you're doing something uh, related to um, to computer vision, you can use them. By default, you're not going to get them. Uh, you can still do your own cluster and use GPU VM machines, but of course that will require a bit more expertise and a bit more um, of, of yourself of configuring that. So uh, by default, or, or, or GCP does not provide uh, GPU VM machines clusters out of the box at it as it provides CPU VM machine clusters. Uh, Edwin, I couldn't really understand your question. If you want to reformulate it, um, I would be happy to, to help. XGBoost is a library in Python to do gradient boosting machines. Gradient boosting machines are a set of algorithms to do different things predictions and it was used to be very popular three or four years, a bit more, four or five years ago. And now it's been left behind because of the explosion of, of deep learning of deep learning. Uh, what do you mean be, uh, for training models that will have to do with your implementation and you have to check out how you train uh, gradient boosting machines in with GZ, XGBoost in um, in Python, but um, yeah, I don't know what you want me to. Um, you have to to check the documentation. I really don't. I'm not. Uh, I don't know them by heart either. So uh, what you need to do there is check out the, the documentation in order to understand what is. Uh, how to do it. And of course, the good thing about XGBoost is that you can use it along with Scikit pipeline, Scikit's pipeline, sorry. So you, you can also include XGBoost within a pipeline. That's very, that's, I think, very, something very useful. Um, any other questions? The, what is most efficient ML library that will depend on what you need to do? That is, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say there's one more efficient than the other that will depend on what you want to do and how you want to achieve it. Um, they do different things, basically. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, measure them in terms of efficiency. I would uh, measure them in terms of accuracy for a particular problem. So my, always my recommendation for people is you don't need to use to to train a deep learning network for everything. Uh, you may, if if you get better results with a linear linear regression, then just use linear regression. How about using Keras? No, Keras is not supported. I mean, not out of, not out of the box. You will need to create your own cluster and configure it yourself. Okay, so if there are no other questions, uh, I will move on. Uh, 
just briefly, we are briefly over. This is how we have, when well, we were talking about uh, training our applications within uh, CloudML, and CloudML uses, um, uh, if, if you want to, to, to train it using Python, you have to package it up in a, in a certain special way. Here it's, a, it's an example where in, you have a, a main folder, in this case, takes Taxifair, where you have the setup.py. The setup.py has all the required libraries and uh, versions and that kind of things that have to be installed in order to, to perform the, 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 the whole um, uh, trainings workload, uh, the, 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 the trainings pipeline. Then you have to have a submodule called trainer where you will have the, the init and then the tax.py is the one that administrates the whole training process and the model.py is the one that runs the that has the contains the logic of the model itself. Well some some commands in order to 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 run uh, cloudml well this is in order to check uh, if everything is working appropriately. And after that, you have two possibilities. You can train locally or you can submit a job. When you submit a job, as, as I was uh, ask, um, answering Bruno, uh, what you do is basically run, I mean, um, behind the scenes what GCP is doing. It's not so behind the scenes because you can, you can get into data flow and see what it's doing. But what, you, what it's doing is basically running a data flow job that is doing the training uh, distributedly. If you if you do it locally, of course, you're not having a distributed architecture. Uh, sometimes you can, uh, the, the good thing about training locally is that you can maybe train with a smaller set and see how it behaves, so very quickly, and then uh, as part of, of, of the exploration, and then go to uh, CloudML uh, and submit a job which uh, with much more data, which will uh, redone in, in, in a more solid model. Well, as we said, since we can work on a pipeline, then the API will have the pipeline in it. So the application, we have the whole pipeline in it, and we will not have what, we, what it's called a um, training serving SKU, that is the, um, the changes that are produced because of the way we uh, pre-process and, uh, and create features during training and how we adjust that to the um, serving process or the, the, the deployed model. And since we are working, if we work within the pipeline, then it's uh, that, that problem is already solved by the, the web application itself. So, and to finish, well, this is how we create, um, how we set up uh, a model in, in the CLI, in the command line interface. We have the model name, we have a version, we have the location. The location is where the, the model is stored. That's something very important. When you use CloudML, you have, uh, once the training is completed, the, the process leaves, um, a binary file with the model within a bucket. We have already talked about what a bucket is. And here, when you want to, to deploy it, you have to point to, the, to where the bucket is in order to get, uh, in order to, to, to make a web application out of it. So how we do it in, in CLIs, G Cloud, ML Engines, Model Grail, these two uh, lines. But we can also do it, I'm going to show you briefly. We can also do that in the GUI. We go to ML Engine, we go to Models. We have new model, and let's put new model. Go on, create. Then we go to our new model and we create a version. That's the two commands that we have seen that were out there. And here you have the, the, the different characteristics. Here is where you can 
go and, and here's where you point to the to the binary file that contains the model and here is what we have just said we can put out auto scaling or you can put manual scaling however i always strongly recommend you to leave that auto scaled well so a bit of a reference where you can find more info and uh, by taking part of this um, of this webinar, you have access to uh, Quick Labs uh, for one month. And out of the Quick Labs is a platform where you can uh, do it. Uh, what we have just seen and many uh, and some other things in a, a practically, you can you can check it out yourselves and you can play with the tool a bit a bit more intensively. There are four labs that which I recommend you. It's natural language, cloud speech, ML engine, and cloud data lab. They are all related to what we have just seen. And well, you don't need to, to copy this. You're going to get in the follow-up email all the information necessary to access the Quick Labs. And if you're interested, we provide trainings on these five, um, among others, on these five uh, Google Cloud related uh, topics, this fundamentals, that's a one day course uh, about big data machine learning, a data engineering course, which, which, is, which covers all the, all the, um, the GCP or big part of GCP ecosystem and what we can do to, to make models in GCP. Then from data to insights, that's a two day course, of course, uh, also for for uh, data analysis, but in BigQuery, that's another product. Then we have um, a packet for a certified professional data engineer that's for preparing for the exam. And then we have another course about machine learning with TensorFlow. And for any other course regarding Google Cloud, you can go to flame.de slash n slash Google Cloud and check it out. So thank you very, very much. I appreciate that you um, I hope you, you enjoyed it. And of course, if you have any other question, just uh, please write it down. OK. So given that there are no other questions, I just uh, would like to thank you very, very much for attending the course. And I hope to, to see you in future, uh, future opportunities. Oh, sorry, um, PyTorch uh, cannot be used. Um, no, so the, the answer Sergio is no. You can also, you can always um, only, sorry, use um, TensorFlow out of the box. You can, of course, always set up your own cluster and do it. Okay, so um, I would like to thank you as well and hope to see you or um, have another webinar with you soon. So thank you very much and have a nice day, evening or night, wherever you are. Thank you.